Hi, Terry Shanefell from UAB School of Medicine. In part two of this two-part series on how to critically appraise a harm study, I'll discuss the last two questions that you need to answer as you read observational studies. In this video, we're going to cover the last two questions that you have to answer as you read an observational study. As a reminder, we're critically appraising the Nurses Health Study, a large cohort study that looked at the relationship between postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy and the risk of cardiovascular disease. So the third question we have to ask ourselves is were exposures and outcomes measured in the same way in both groups? Let's look at a, an example study to try to demonstrate the problem if we don't do this. So investigators report a threefold increase in the risk of melanoma in individuals working with radioactive materials. What would happen if physicians who are concerned about the risk associated with radioactive materials search more diligently in those who were exposed to radiation than those who weren't? Could you see that there could be a problem if you look harder in an exposed group than an unexposed group? This leads to something called surveillance bias. And researchers really need to do the same things, look just as hard in both groups, both exposed and unexposed. They shouldn't do things differently. One way to help do that is to blind the researchers to exposure status in a cohort study or to outcome status in the hypothesis of the study in a case control study. We don't want their knowledge of exposure status or outcome status to influence how they look for data in the study. We also need to have standardized methods that are used the exact same way in both groups. We want standardized definitions of what an exposure is, we need standardized definitions of what an outcome is, and we need them applied the same in both groups. So where could researchers get information on exposure? There's four different places. One, they could use pre-existing records. These are easy to use. They're already readily available. But the problem is they can often be incomplete because many times these records, which are physicians' records or administrative databases, were not designed for study purposes. So sometimes there's not information in them that the researchers might need. You could interview people or give them questionnaires either to the patients themselves, the doctors of the patient, or family members. You can get very complete data here because you can ask whatever you want. But the problem is it can be biased. And a particular problem in uh, case control studies and, and retrospective studies is recall bias. So recall bias is people with disease tend to think more about the problem they have, what could have caused it, and differentially remember exposures compared to people who don't have that disease. Another way we could get information would be through proxy measures, and here we're trying to estimate an exposure, um, for example, by using a job title. So let's say there was a uh, worry about radiation exposure. Well, we could get a group of people whose job titles would indicate somebody who might be exposed to radiation. Um, if there's a chemical spill at a plant, we might use proximity measures like a miles radius around the plant, but these can be inaccurate. Finally, we could do direct measurement. And this is often the best, but sometimes direct measurement is not available. So if you're doing a retrospective study, you can't often go back and directly measure the level of some exposure that you'd like. So let's see how good the Nurses Health Study did. So I want you to pause the video and read these excerpts from the Nurses Health Study and see if you think the exposures and outcomes were measured the same way in both groups. When you've got your answer, restart the video and see how your answer compares to mine. So let's see how you did. So both groups, both cohorts, both the nurses who used hormones and those who didn't completed questionnaires every two years. And they both got the same exact questionnaire. So the researchers did a good job of looking for exposures and outcomes in the exact same way. These, these questionnaires look for hormone replacement therapy and also look for outcomes. As you can see in this bottom part down here, when certain outcomes were indicated on the questionnaire, Medical records were pulled to confirm those outcomes. So the Nurses Health Study did a good job here. The final question you need to ask is, was follow-up sufficiently long and complete? And follow-up needs to be long enough for the people in the study to potentially develop the outcome of interest. This requires your clinical knowledge and to know the biology of disease and how long things take to develop. We also want to keep track of every single person who entered into the study. We like to have nobody lost to follow up. This is often not possible. These are often free living people. Uh, they move away. Things happen. So we expect some losses to follow up. We like to see at least 10% or less loss to follow up. Can accept up to 20%, but that's really starting to, to push how many we'd like to see loss to follow up. 
And losses to follow-up can be a problem, especially if the people who are lost have different outcomes than the people who remain in the study. I hope that seems pretty obvious if that the people left the study because they developed the outcome of interest and we didn't know that could really lead to a very biased study. The alternative is that people did great. They felt so good that they just dropped out of the study. Bottom line is researchers need to tell you something about the people who are lost to follow up. If nothing, if nothing else, their demographics. But it would be nice if they could tell you at least some of the outcomes that they had. There's also problems if the exposed and unexposed groups are followed up differently. So we need everybody to be followed up the exact same. So how did the Nurses Health Study do? So pause the video, read these two excerpts, and see if you think follow-up was sufficiently long and complete. When you've got your answer, restart the video and see how it compares to mine. So how did you do? So the follow-up in the Nurses Health Study was greater than 90%, so they lost 10% of people. That's pretty good in such a big cohort, followed for such a long period of time across the entire United States. It's pretty remarkable. They had lots of participants and they follow people, people for about 20 years. So you have to decide for yourself, is 20 years long enough to see cardiovascular disease? And I think so. The average age of women when they go through menopause is around 50. And if you figure 20 years, that's up to age 70. Probably we would have seen cardiovascular disease manifest in this period of time. So I think the Nurses Health Study meets this fine. So my assessment of the Nurses Health Study, in hindsight, it was really at risk for residual confounding, but we didn't know this at the time. We thought it gave a very robust answer because it was a very well-designed study. But in hindsight, there probably was residual confounding. So what do you do if a study has some bias in it? Well, there are three things you can do. One is you could just go on, read the results, and just realize that the findings are going to be biased and make some adjustments in, in what you feel is the impact of that bias. If there's multiple studies, well, you just find another study and see what kind of answer it gets. And finally, sometimes when there is nothing else and a study so biased, you just have to throw it in the garbage and wait for a new study to be done. Videos have helped you understand how to critically appraise a study about harm. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the contact me section of my blog. Have a great day.